Hey, good evening and thanks for joining us for KGW News at 5. I'm Brittany Folker is here with meteorologist Joe Ranieri. It is day eight of now historic heat wave. And Joe, not only is this nonstop heat really uncomfortable, mm -hmm. it can also be pretty dangerous. Absolutely right. We've you know heard reports that this is now not only historic, but it's also a deadly heat wave. This mm. start basically started last Sunday a week ago and it's going to continue into tomorrow with temperatures right around 90 or above. I don't expect us to go above 90 tomorrow, but again, Brittany, we're looking at temperatures close to 100 degrees at this hour throughout much of the metro area. Portland is at 97 degrees, 98 in Hillsborough. Sherwood and Forest Grove are both seeing temperatures at the century mark at 100 degrees. For some of you, this marks the third day in a row with temperatures 100 or above. And we will start to cool down heading into tomorrow. But again, we're still going to be seeing lots of watches and warnings at least the next couple of hours here locally because of the heat, either a heat advisory or an excessive heat warning. You can see over in the Dallas temperature of 105 Pendleton, you're seeing temperatures right around 100 degrees. The cool spot this entire stretch uh, has been along the Oregon coast where you've been seeing temperatures perfect for this time of year. 61 degrees over in Cannon Beach. You have been seeing some pretty thick clouds here the last couple of uh, days to start things off and by the afternoon those clouds burn off. But what we're picking up here in the metro area, some smoke and haze and some of this smoke and haze is coming from those wildfires that are burning along the Oregon uh, Southern Oregon and Northern California border. Brittany will talk about that in a second, but we're sitting at 97 degrees right now. Tomorrow today marks the eighth day in a row with temperatures 90 or warmer and we stay warm overnight and during this heat wave, we really haven't seen much of a cool down uh, throughout the overnight. The coolest I think temperatures have been about right around 66 67 degrees on average. Cooler tomorrow, but staying on the warmer side. Last seven days, this is record 95 degrees or warmer and as we look into the next couple of days, things will start to improve a little bit. But again, the air quality will be taking a hit heading into the next couple of days, especially throughout Southern Oregon. And if you're thinking if you're looking outside right now, you start to see some smoke and haze that will continue the next couple of days from that wildfire that's burning uh, over in Northern California. Brittany, you have more on that right now. Yeah, that's right, Joe. Yeah, wildfire season. It's ramping up here in the West today. A fire task force from Oregon arrived to help crews in California to battle that fast moving McKinney fire. The flame started in California's Klamath National Forest on Friday and has since burned more than 50,000 acres. The Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office says the fire is not contained at all. Smoke from this fire is creating very poor air quality and light ash fall in the Rogue Valley and beyond. So the Oregon Office of State Fire Marshal mobilized a task force and that arrived in the area today to help protect residents. They're expected to be in California for up to two weeks. Now, further north, crews are dealing with two small wildfires in southern Oregon. The Tolo Mountain Fire has burned about 41 acres since sparking on Friday. And not far from that location, a fire has burned about 100 fires in Windigo Pass. Then this is mostly logging territory, but some roads in the area are closed for public safety. We'll continue to keep an eye on that. And people around the Northwest now have a new tool at their fingertips to get up to date information on wildfires. Julie Calhoun shows us how it works. Helicopters, I took pictures. Terry of Parker has airdrop. lived in his home in Bonnie Lake for 11 years and in 2020 was one of hundreds who had to evacuate during the Sumner grade fire. Got kind of scared because we're hoping it didn't jump the road, you know, because it could have came here and wiped out our neighborhood because it was only half a block away. The fire burned 800 acres and destroyed four homes. Parker says wildfires aren't typical in that area. I've been coming out here since 1964 and never been a fire like that around in this area or that close. Now, the Western Fire Chiefs Association developed a first of its kind fire map that shows up to date information on wildfires happening so people like Parker can quickly take action. It can make a big difference for people that are in rural areas where they may not have really good um, exit areas. The Western Fire Chiefs Association pulls data from 911 dispatch and the U.S. Forest Service to track wildfires burning in real time. On the map, it populates current fire information that is occurring today, has uh, updated information from fires that occurred yesterday, and then it has uh, another layer in there that provides fire information for ongoing fires. It gives the public up to date information on how big a fire is and how much it's contained. Something Parker thinks could have made a huge difference two years ago. You could get information quicker, I think, you know, instead of trying to wait for it to see it on the news. 
you know, you could go on your phone and, and, and look at the map and, and tell where exactly it's at. By next year, fire chiefs hope the map moves into phase two, which will include location-based notifications. People can go to the map and say, hey, this is where I'm at. The new tool coming at the right time, as Chief Johnson says, wildfire season is expected to pick up. The Stammen fire was an early indicator of the, you know, things are getting ready to burn. Just because it rained a lot this spring doesn't mean that uh, we're still not going to have a, a pretty active fire season coming into the fall. Here. And now to COVID news. The pandemic spurred the development of new vaccines and treatments, and it's also prompting research into something else, your sense of smell. Some people temporarily lost that ability to smell when they got the virus, and there's work going on in Philadelphia to understand why. Lauren Make reports. From the summer smells of the boardwalk to a whiff of a favorite flower, for some people, COVID took it away. As a population, we really just like don't realize how important our sense of smell is to like, like understanding like our world. So when people lose it, it's it's really devastating. Dr. Steph Hunter is a postdoctoral fellow at the Monell Center in University City, where they study taste and smell and how it relates to health. <laughs> what is it about COVID that can affect your sense of smell? So the virus affects the supporting cells like in our um, nose. At Monell, they're studying the connection, passing out these cards in a project funded by a grant at a COVID-19 testing site. You can scan the QR code or type in a website, then peel back the plastic to test your nose. You smell A, so I'm gonna smell it, okay. And then smell B, so they're just like these stickers, kind of like in magazines with the perfumes. You'll answer questions online about what you smell, Monell then collecting that info for their research. The influence of the virus on the sense of smell varies by person and variant. Hunter says at the beginning of the pandemic, more than half of people had their smell impacted, but then it was a smaller percentage, and they're still trying to figure out the impact from the variants spreading now. In general, how long is a loss of smell lasting for people? I mean, some people have lost their sense of smell in the beginning of the pandemic and they still haven't got it back. Like is this. there anything they can do? So the one kind of like treatment that's recommended is smell training. For that, get away from the hustle and bustle. Sit in a quiet space for just a couple of minutes each day. Use essential oils or whatever you choose and try to remember what each smells like. Dr. Hunter says that can speed up recovery if you lose the ability to smell the roses. That was Lauren Make reporting there. Now, Dr. Hunter tells us that most people who lose their sense of smell because of COVID do get it back within about a month, but about 15% have to wait longer. Today, an opening ceremony was held for a new bridge in the Lloyd and Central East Side neighborhood. Check it out. You may know it as Sullivan's Crossing. It goes across I-84. See it right there. And before today's celebration, Congressman Earl Blumenauer got to tour the bridge in his name. It was a chance to see the bridge up close and thank those who built it. Tim Gordon has more. The Oregon congressman, long known for his advocacy of riding bikes for fun, exercise and commuting, took a tour this week of the new pedestrian and bike bridge named in his honor. For Earl Blumenauer, spanning Sullivan's Gulch at Northeast 7th Avenue this way is a long time coming. For me, it's a realization of a vision that goes back 30 years when I was the Commissioner of Public Works for the City of Portland. Even as workers made the finishing touches on the Blumenauer Bridge, the congressman talked with project leaders and others walking the 475-foot-long, 20-foot-wide bridge just days before its opening day celebration. The $19 million Portland Bureau of Transportation project started in late 2019 and faced delays. Getting the span in place required a major shutdown of Interstate 84, but now it's ready to connect the central east side to the Lloyd District and beyond. This makes a seismic, safe, um, emergency response ready and uh, everyday, car-free, comfortable connection. The new bridge is built to withstand a major earthquake and to handle emergency vehicle traffic if needed. And as you can find out from the men and women who did this, it was not easy when you're going over a freeway, uh, light rail, the train, uh, and contending with some slopes and design issues, uh, it's, but it's worth it. Blumenauer says the bridge with his name on it keeps Portland moving in the right direction. And the notion here of being able to connect the central east side with the Lloyd 
uh, just made so much sense. Tim Gordon, KGW News. Well, now PPOT says it will start construction this coming week on two projects that will connect to the Blumenauer Bridge. The Northeast Rose Lane project will improve TriMet bus service in the area, and the 7th Avenue Neighborhood Greenway project will create a new bike connection in that area.